During November, we're going to be looking at some passages from the prophet Isaiah as part of leading up to Christmas, because Isaiah speaks very much of the coming of Jesus. And today we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 40, the first eight verses. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up and every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God stands forever. When you get to chapter 40 of Isaiah, both the content and the style change rather radically. It's led a number of commentators to suggest that it's a different author. In fact, they put forward that there are three authors um, wrote the book of Isaiah. But there is Apart from speculation, there is no real evidence of this and no reason to believe that it's not the same Isaiah that we read at the beginning who saw the vision of the Lord in the temple writing right through to the end of the book. He's writing now at a, an interesting time in Israel's history. We're about roughly 700 years before Jesus. The world power is Assyria. And as world powers do, they're engaged in conquering the world. Hezekiah is the king in Jerusalem. He thinks he can keep the Assyrians away by an alliance with Egypt. Isaiah is God's prophet. And he says quite clearly, this will not work. The Egyptians will not save you. Trust in God. God will deliver you. The country in those days notionally followed God. But at least the powerful, the comfortable, it was quite a token thing. Sort of idea that, yes, well, it's the Sabbath, so we're not going to work, but give our servants and our slaves a day off. Certainly not. What are you thinking about? How will we be looked after? And yes, we'll, we'll send offerings to the temple when we feel like it, but perhaps we'll, on the side we'll do a few offerings to a few other gods just in case, you know. And uh, there was nominal adherence to the Lord, but very token. And Hezekiah is a guy, he's, yes, he'd say he believed in God, but you know, you've got to be practical, haven't you? You've got to sort things out. He was a great politician and he was going to sort out the problem of Assyria and he'd got all his plans for uh, linking up with Egypt. The Assyrian general was called Sennacherib. And eventually the time came when uh, he's, his armies came down through Israel, surrounded Jerusalem. The Egyptians were no use at all. They didn't turn up. And there's Hezekiah trapped in the city with all the people and the Assyrian army surrounding them. And Sennacherib sends a letter with just of which says, look, your God's no better than all the other gods. We've beaten all this lot and this lot and this lot and their gods didn't help them, so don't you rely on your God, he's a load of rubbish. It's a very dangerous thing to challenge the true and the living God. It woke Hezekiah up, he took the letter to the temple and he spread it out and he prayed over it. O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You've made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. 
It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these people in their lands. They've thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, O Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. And Sennacherib, uh, Hezekiah prays, and Isaiah says, God has heard that prayer. And we come to um, one of the very famous stories of uh, the Bible, because as that army is camped round Jerusalem, it says, then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshipping in the temple of his god, Nisroch, his sons, Adramelech and Sherezer, cut him down with a sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat, and Ezarhaddon, his son, succeeded him as king. God answers the prayer. He may have worked in a very direct miracle with the angel of death. He may have worked through normal circumstances, as God often works, uh, tightly packed camp surrounding a city was not the most hygienic place in the world. So it's perfectly feasible that a plague ran through the camp and killed uh, a whole lot of men all at one time. Certainly we know from other historians, they don't say what the reason was, but they say that Sennacherib besieged Jerusalem, got nowhere and went back and the city was saved. Sennacherib as Isaiah had prophesied, doesn't last very much longer. They're a lovely lot in those days, killing their dads and all that kind of thing, weren't they? Very brutal culture. Well, Hezekiah's brought it to God in prayer. God's answered in the most amazing way. So does Hezekiah trust in God? No. He's back to his politicking again. And within a few years, he's showing ambassadors from Babylon. Babylon at that time was an up and coming empire and uh, he's showing them all the treasury of the palace all his riches and wealth he's trying to impress them look we're, we're good people you want to be on our side mate you want to ally with us he's trying to get this um, partnership going again because he's got his way of dealing with the problems and Isaiah says to him there will be no alliance with Babylon in fact Babylon will conquer Israel and the people will go into exile in Babylon and what should have happened then normally speaking is that Israel should have disappeared from the face of the earth as a nation once taken into exile and split up and lost its land and all that you sh we should have heard no more of Israel there are many countries mentioned in the Old Testament that no longer exist but Isaiah said no it won't be like that after 70 years I, God, will bring you back and you'll rebuild the nation. And not only will you rebuild the nation, but you will have a key part to play in God's plans for the world. And from chapter 40 onwards to the end, it's all about God's plan for the future. The hope that God brings. Not only will Israel be rebuilt, but God has plans to draw other nations, to create a new Israel, the church, to inherit, to make his kingdom worldwide, to bring the salvation that he's promised Israel to all. And this will be accomplished, Isaiah says, by his servant. And a whole lot of the passages as you go through the rest of Isaiah, and that encourages, not an easy book, but um, if you get a chance and you, you're you know, during lockdown, you're looking for something to read. Uh, work your way through Isaiah, especially the, the second half, but all of it if you can. But in that second half, this, this mysterious servant appears who's going to achieve great things for God. And the people then didn't quite know who that would be or how or what. But we know that servant was God himself come in human form as Jesus there are one or two hints of it in the passage that we read. It talks about sin having been paid for. 
How did Israel pay for her sin? Well, she couldn't pay for her sin. 70 years exile in, in Babylon wouldn't pay for sin. The sin was paid for when Jesus came and died on the cross and bore the sin of the world. The servant was the one who paid the penalty of sin. Isaiah picks it up much more clearly a bit later on in chapter 53. Speaking of the servant, he says, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The people of Israel kept on sinning. Hezekiah turns to God when he needs to and then goes back to his old way. And what's true of them was true of us. And the only way the salvation could come and forgiveness could come was that God himself took the punishment we deserved. Verse 3 also will be familiar to you. We read about a voice crying in the wilderness. And uh, we pick it up in Matthew's Gospel. And here's the coming of John the Baptist to proclaim Jesus. And from chapter 40 through to the end of the book, as you'll see in coming weeks, Isaiah speaks of the amazing plan of God, a plan of comfort, of hope, and of salvation. It's a complicated issue, isn't it? Trying to work out how is God involved in the world? I find the most helpful place is in uh, a reflection written just after the people had gone into exile. It's in our Bible as the book of Lamentations, probably written by Jeremiah. And he asks the question, why has Israel been defeated? Why have they been taken away? And he says, well, because we've been sinful and we deserve it and we brought all this on ourselves. And yes, you can see, humanly speaking, the, how the political stance of Israel and the way they behave brought this on them. Then he says, well, because of the sin of Babylon, because they were determined to have a world empire. And so their sin has brought this on us. And then he says, because it was God's plan and purpose. And here's the strange thing. When he gets to that point where he says, this was God's plan and purpose, he says, therefore, I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. If you trusted in the Babylonians, well, they could have simply wiped everything out. Mass genocide. If we trust simply to our own efforts, we can destroy ourselves. But if it's part of God's plan and purpose, God will act in mercy and love and faithfulness. It's difficult to know. God sometimes works amazing miracles and takes the problem away instantly. More often, God works in and through the circumstances that this fallen world has brought on us and gives us strength and guidance to endure. So what do we learn from those situations many, many years ago in our present situation? I think the first thing that we've learned through this COVID situation is that we don't have all the answers. Did you notice what Isaiah said? When asked what to preach, he's told, all men are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people of grass. It's not a flattering picture, is it? I remember in the early days of schools work, one of the subjects you often got asked to talk about was science and Christianity. And there was a general assumption. It was this, science is fact. Christianity is just vague belief. Science has got the answers. Christianity just sort of makes it up as it goes along. And what we've discovered in this thing is the scientists don't have all the answers. And if you've got two scientists, you've got three opinions. We cannot do it ourselves. Yes, we must use all the intelligence that God has given us, the knowledge, the skill, the technology, the medicine, everything that God has given us and has developed over the years. 
But if we trust in that alone, we will not get anywhere. We don't have all the answers. In fact, I was talking about this before the service, our technology and our progress has actually made this virus situation worse. Because we can now travel around the world in no time at all. And so the virus can travel around the world with us. We learn from Isaiah that we don't have all the answers. We learn too from Isaiah that God is still at work. God does not give up on his people. God will never give up on his people. God will strengthen us. God will encourage us. Maybe God will work a miracle and the virus will simply disappear. More likely God will work through those who are uh, scientists and doctors and uh, what have you to bring a solution. And God is still working in salvation. You see, for the moment, our focus is all on this crisis. But actually, people still need Jesus. Still need to find forgiveness. Still need to find new life. So what can we do? We can pray. Paul tells Timothy, pray for kings and rulers and those in authority. I wonder, are you praying? For the government, they need it. Any government does. Let's pray. There's going to be a debate in Parliament. I think that's why things don't happen till Thursday. The lockdown, there's got to be discussions and debate. Let's pray for wisdom. Not for people posturing and, and making points and trying to show off. But actually seeking the best way forward. Let's pray for scientists. Yes, science is all about facts and logic and all the rest of it. But sometimes it just needs that flash of inspiration where somebody looks at a set of results and says, oh, that could mean such and such. Let's pray that God will give inspiration to those who do that. Whatever we personally think about lockdown, let's pray that it will be successful. God, will you sort out this next month so that at the end of it, we don't have to do it again? If that's what we want, let's ask for it. We don't have to pray right prayers and try and guess the prayers that God wants us to pray. If it's on our hearts, let's ask for it. God, we want to be delivered from this thing. And let's continue to share the gospel. The good news of forgiveness in Jesus and that trust in him changes everything. It may seem irrelevant. What's that got to do with all this virus? It's the center of everything in God's purposes. And whether we're proclaiming it through the internet or in whatever conversations we can have with people, whether we're proclaiming it in practical care, it's been tremendous to see the amount of food that's been distributed, for instance, over the last few months, and much of it by churches. But whatever means we can do, let's share the good news of Jesus. We've heard all sorts of different messages recently. It's almost become a joke, isn't it, that somebody stands up some leader one day and then somebody stands up the next day and contradicts it and then somebody stands up the next day and says something again and we've had all these different messages Isaiah reminds us the word of our God stands forever if you've got time on your hands during lockdown what better way than to give some time to bible reading and to prayer a bit extra from what we normally do let's use the time that we've got to get closer to God and as we're able to share him with others. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're at work as much now as you were in the time of Isaiah, that you can work great miracles, that you can work through normal means, that you can inspire and guide leaders and scientists, that you can bless and encourage us, that you can give us opportunities we never dreamt of would come up. So, Father, we commit all this to you, Pray that you will inspire us in our prayer life, inspire us in getting into your word, inspire us in sharing the good news with others. And be with us all, even when we're separated. For Jesus' sake. Amen.